It's the cornerstone of musical theater. Howdy, theater fans. This is Broadway Explained, and today we'll be covering Andrew Lloyd Webber's masterpiece. This is everything you need to know about Broadway's longest-running musical. For more of Broadway's best explanations, please visit our channel and subscribe to receive notifications of our newest videos. In the 1980s, Andrew Lloyd Webber, fresh off the success of musicals such as Starlight Express, Jesus Christ Superstar, Evita, and Cats, approached producer Cameron McIntosh to breathe life into a timeless but considerably distant story. Before Webber and McIntosh, The Phantom of the Opera was a story really only brought to life on the silver screen. Two Motion Pictures, a 1925 silent film starring film legend Lon Chaney, and a 1943 Universal Classic were at one point the only major artistic works both based on the French novel of the same name. After some initial roadblocks, Weber composed the music, worked with Charles Hart and Richard Stilgo for lyrics, and recruited familiar names and previous associates to get the show on its feet. This included costume and set designer Maria Bjornsson, choreographer Gillian Lynn, and director Hal Prince. The Phantom of the Opera would open on West End in 1986 before opening on Broadway in 1988. The Majestic Theatre, which has hosted the Broadway production continuously to this day, has become iconic in and of itself, hosting the same show for 32 years, longer than any other. From cold, unfeeling the Phantom of the Opera is a story of music, romance, mystery, terror, and talent. Like many great stories, the musical begins at the end. Audiences first witness an auction occurring at a decrepit old opera house. After selling some trinkets from a different time, the auctioneer refers to an interesting music box and also mentions the strange affair of the Phantom of the Opera, a mystery never fully explained. From there, the stage is transformed as a broken chandelier comes to life and the setting dramatically changes to the tune of the show's overture. We are then thrust into the bygone heyday of the opera house, which is lively, warm, gilded, and populous. In late 19th century France, the company of the Opera Populaire is rehearsing for a new production based on the Roman adversary Hannibal. The rehearsal is interrupted, however, by a business transaction, and it's announced that the venue has come under new management. Has freed us! Oh, I wouldn't say free. More like under new management. <laughs> the new managers, Gilles André and Richard Fierman, approach the leading soprano Carlotta Giudicelli for a personal rendition of a song. Carlotta, very self-absorbed and pompous, is the typical prima donna of the opera house. Uh, what are you I'm asking? asking? Well, I'm asking. Did you you said a me? sentence. There was no question. However, this isn't the typical opera house, and is supposedly haunted. This stays true to the theater legend, as most theaters are supposedly haunted by a theater ghost or spirit, which is why many venues actually have a long-held tradition of putting out a night or ghost light to keep the spirits at bay. But back to Phantom. In the middle of Carlotta's song, a set piece mysteriously falls, and the prima donna becomes enraged at the dismissive nature of André and Firman. In true diva fashion, Carlotta quits in a fit and leaves an opening in the cast. I'm out. Desperate to find a replacement, André and Firmand take heed from the ballet master, Madame Giry, to replace Carlotta with Christine Daillé. Christine, who is a recently orphaned chorus girl, is revealed to have incredible singing talent and is not to mention much more humble, younger, and prettier than Carlotta. Her eventual performance gains the attention of the opera's wealthy patron, Raoul the Vicomte de Chauny. The two were friends in their youth, and Raoul is almost immediately drawn to Christine. After her first show, Christine confides in Meg Giry, who is the daughter of the ballet master. In her humble discussion, Christine credits her success to the Angel of Music, who she believes was sent by her recently deceased father to bless her with incredible singing ability. Soon after, Raoul visits Christine and the two share a tender moment reminiscing their youth. Christine shares the Angel of Music story with Raoul, who indulges her for a moment, but is a bit dismissive. When she is left alone for a few minutes, Christine hears a mysterious voice who she believes is the Angel of Music. Sounding angry and irritated that the young girl has forgotten him, Christine then opens up to her quote-unquote teacher. Revealing himself in her dressing room mirror, Christine is put into a near trance-like state and is drawn to the masked figure. Then, in an iconic moment of musical theater, Christine follows the masked figure into the mirror, and he then leads her into a complex labyrinth beneath the opera house. The music that underscores the scene reveals that the figure is actually the Phantom of the Opera, who has haunted the opera house and is in love with Christine and her voice. The scene is perhaps one of the most well-recognized moments of the show, as the masked Phantom leads Christine into his lair on a secret underground lake. After serenading Christine with the music of the night, the masked Phantom proposes marriage in a non-verbal gesture, and Christine swoons from the shock. She is awakened sometime later by the Phantom, who is composing music from his organ. Curious to see who is behind the mask, Christine sneaks up on the phantom and removes it from his face. This reveals the phantom is horribly disfigured, and he yells in rage. 
Both equally horrified, the two separate quickly, and the Phantom begins to explain his dark fate. Only wanting to be loved, the Phantom is not the angel of music Christine thought he was, and is instead revealed to be a tortured soul who laments in his loneliness and depression. Christine returns the mask to him out of pity, and then he returns her to the Opera House surface. On the surface, Bouquet, the chief stagehand, mockingly tells the story of the opera Ghost, who he recounts as having a ghastly appearance and magical powers. Madame Giry warns him to hold his tongue or face the wrath of the Phantom. On the administrative side, Andre and Firman are celebrating the commercial and critical success of the show, but are baffled by mysterious letters supposedly coming from the Phantom. Raoul and Carlotta, joined by the company's lead tenor Piangi, enter the office complaining that they too are also receiving strange letters. Raoul has been essentially told to stay away from Christine, and Carlotta has been told that she will no longer be leading lady. Madame Giry then enters with a letter from the Phantom demanding that Christine star in the new production of Il Muto, and that he be reserved a box seat. If the demands are not met, the Phantom promises that he will cast his fury across the opera house. Andre and Firman ignore this, however, and promise that Carlotta will be the star again, and give Christine a silent role. Ha <laughs> you fool! You fell victim to one of the classic blunders! On the opening night of Il Muto, the Phantom interrupts the production several times. First, he scorns that his box seat was not kept open. Next, after Carlotta insultingly calls Christine a little toad, the Phantom curses the prima donna's voice so that instead of singing, she croaks like a frog. Jimmy, was she a frog? Oh, that looks great, Carl. As his laugh echoes around the opera house, Firman halts the production and announces that Christine will replace Carlotta for the duration of the show. However, with the Phantom wanting to punish the Opera House for the lackluster production, he kills Bouquet, the chief stagehand. In a horrifying fashion, the Phantom suspends the body of Bouquet by the neck over the stage in view of everyone in the audience. The Opera House erupts into chaos, but Andre and Firman insert that it was merely an accident. In the wake of this, Christine escapes with Rao to the roof of the Opera House to tell him what she knows about the Phantom. Christine is terrorized and scared, but Raoul assures her that he will protect and love her. Christine promises that she will love and be with Raoul as well. As the two return inside to finish the performance, the Phantom emerges. Unknowing to both of them, the Phantom listens in on their conversation. Devastated and heartbroken, the Phantom turns his sadness into rage and anger, and vows to lash out in revenge. Act 1 closes with the Phantom sabotaging the chandelier, causing it to crash onto stage during the curtain call of El Muto. The first act closes in chaos and disarray. Act 2 opens six months after the disaster of El Muto. Andre and Firman, accompanied by Madame Jury, the company of the Opera House, and Christine and Raoul, who are now secretly engaged, are celebrating good fortune at a masquerade ball. The Opera House has a new chandelier, and the Phantom hasn't been seen since the disaster of El Muto. But of course, the party is interrupted by the Phantom, as he comes with a new set of demands. First, he wants Andre and Firman to produce his new musical, Don Juan Triumphant, and second, he wants Christine to be cast in the main role. He notices that Christine is now engaged, and his subsequent fury breaks up the party. As everyone leaves in fear, Raoul confronts Madame Giry to learn more about the Phantom. Reluctant at first to share what she knows, Giry eventually confines in Raoul. Instead of just a tortured soul, Giry tells Raoul that the Phantom is actually a brilliant scholar, an inventor, a genius composer, magician, and architect. Unfortunately, he was born with a physical deformity that made him a societal outcast. There was even one point where he was even trapped in a freak show and put on display for public humiliation. Eventually, he escapes from the show and found refuge in the Opera House. Raoul, while taken back by Jiri's story, is still determined to end the terror of the Phantom and to capture him. Working with Andre and Firmam, Raoul devises a plan to capture the Phantom during the premiere of Don Juan Triumphant. Things begin to go wrong for the Opera House. During this, Carlotta, jealous of Christine, accuses the young singer of being behind the chaos. Pleading that she is not behind anything, Christine distances herself from the any association with the Phantom. Andre and Firman believe that having Christine sing is the only way to ensnare the Phantom. They plan to use her as a form of bait before arresting and killing the Phantom. Christine, very frightened, is worried that if she is captured, the Phantom will never let her go. She is assured by Rao that it will be okay, but still runs off in tears. During the rehearsal of the Phantom's opera, the music of Don Juan Triumphant appears Byzantine, and the leading tenor Piangi is unable to properly sing the notes. Because the music director was not playing the piano accordingly, the Phantom then possesses the piano and everyone sings correctly. For additional comfort and guidance, Christine visits her father's grave in the nearby cemetery and laments that he was taken too soon and left her all alone. In her grief, the Phantom appears atop a mausoleum disguised as the Angel of Music. Similar to how he first appeared in Act 1, he has the same entrancing power over Christine. As she's drawn to him, Christine is stopped by Raoul, who stops her from blindly walking back into the Phantom's clutches. Just- oh. You, oh. This is, oh. 
thwarted in his attempt to capture her. The Phantom uses magic to attack the two of them with fireballs, unofficially bringing war upon them both. The trap for the Phantom remains in place for the opening of Don Juan Triumphant. Security is put in place by Raul to shoot and kill the Phantom on sight. The opera runs its course and leads to the seductive scene between the characters played by Christine and Pianji. Pianji's character exits the stage for a moment while Christine sings. During this, the Phantom secretly exchanges roles and shares a romantic duet with Christine. After a few bars, she realizes that she's not singing with Pianji, but instead the Phantom. Imitating Rao's pledge of love on the night of Il Muto, the Phantom expresses his love and devotion to Christine and forcibly puts a ring on her finger. In response, Christine unmasks him, this time exposing his deformity to the entire opera house. Once again horrified, the Phantom escapes before he can be shot by Rao's security. He drags Christine with him back to his lair, and chaos erupts on stage. It is revealed at this time that the Phantom has killed again, but this time, he has strangled Pianji, whose body is revealed in horror. An angry mob searches for the Phantom and Christine, but instead of joining them, Rao hunts separately. With the help of Madame Giri, Rao is led to the Phantom's lair and is taught how to avoid being killed by him. While this is happening, Christine is brought to the Phantom's lair. The Phantom once again laments how unfairly he has been treated by the world because of his deformity, revealing that even his own mother despised him. He forces Christine to wear a wedding dress, and is no longer afraid of concealing his face around her. The Phantom tells Christine that her fate is to remain with him forever, and share in his dark fate with him. Christine expresses that she's no longer horrified by the Phantom's distorted appearance, but by the distorted nature of his soul. Ouch. They are then interrupted by Rao, who managed to reach the lair before the mob could. Rao begs the Phantom not to take his anger out on Christine and free her in an act of compassion. The Phantom retorts by saying that nobody ever showed him any form of compassion, so he will not do so. Rao is then trapped by the Phantom with his Punjab lasso, or the magical rope. Giving Christine an ultimatum, the Phantom offers to free Rao, only if she agrees to stay with him forever. If not, he will kill Rao in front of her, then release Christine to the surface. After both of the men vie for Christine, she decides to show the Phantom an act of compassion. She passionately kisses him and embraces him twice, saying that he will never be alone in the world. Taken back by the first act of compassion ever shown to him, he frees them both, giving the couple a chance to escape on the promise that they will never share what happened. They quickly hurry away from the lair, but Christine returns to give the Phantom the ring he placed on her finger. In a tender moment, the Phantom pledges that he will always love Christine as she tearfully escapes with Rao. With the mob closing in on him now, the Phantom expresses how he has been freed from his fate by the act of compassion shown by Christine. He is devastated from losing her, but finally respects her decisions. The last we see of the Phantom is the act of him sitting down and covering himself with a cloak. Meg Jiri finds the lair first, and approaches the covered figure, expecting to find the Phantom under the cloak. To her surprise, the Phantom is not there, and all that is under the cloak is the Phantom's mask. Mystified, Meg lifts the mask up in wonder, puzzled over where the Phantom could be. And that's how the show ends, concluding with the mystery that the show began with. Anyway, that is everything you need to know about Andrew Lloyd Webber's The Phantom of the Opera. While there has been a sequel produced called Love Never Dies, that is a story for another time. What do you guys think? Did we miss anything? Would you change anything about The Phantom of the Opera? What show would you like us to cover next? Leave a comment and share with anyone who might be interested. Remember to subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Broadway Explained. End Curtain. <laughs>